I'm at the place in children's ministry, we've been doing this for over 25 years or so, where I could come up here and I could share all kinds of resources with you guys. I could share how you do this and how you do that. But to be honest, all that can be found on the internet these days. There's resources galore for children's ministry. Um, so I'm, this morning I'd like to share from my heart four things that's really on my heart of where children's ministry is going, what we need to be doing, some things that I just see that's going on that, that I really would like to address within the children's ministry realm. And it's such a privilege to speak to so many children's ministers this morning. And you guys are a blessed, blessed group of children's ministers. And, um, you know, it's within our hands to shape and mold this generation. It's within our hands to shape and mold this generation. None of us can do it alone. But as we partner with the families in our churches and our communities, we can actually cause change in, those, in our churches, in our communities. We can make a difference. This morning I'd like to share four things that's really on my heart concerning children's ministry. The first thing, when I was preparing for this, I, I put out on my Facebook page. If you're not following us on Facebook, look up Jubilee Gang on Facebook. You can find our fan page. And when you say Jubilee Gang, my page, well, my um, personal one will come up to Jerry Moyer, Jubilee Gang. You can befriend me or like Jubilee Gang Ministries, either one. But I put a question out there, and I said, what is the greatest strengths and greatest weaknesses of modern-day children's ministry? The answers were almost unanimous. The strengths and the weakness of modern-day children's ministry. The strengths that almost everyone said, almost probably 80, 90 percent said resources is the greatest strength of children's ministry today. We have everything from Facebook groups for children's ministry. We have our own kid men um, social network called cmconnect.org. I don't know if you're on that. If you're not, I encourage you to join it, cmconnect.org. Children's Ministry Connect. Children's pastors from all over the world are on there. You can ask questions in groups. You can join groups, ask questions, have discussions, share resources. It's awesome. Um, we have the curriculums that we're offering here. We have There's tons of curriculums available today. Back when I started in children's ministry, it was Willie George and Willie George alone. <laughs> And the only resources we had was in the back of his little manual that he printed off for his, his conferences. And it had a list of all the web uh, not websites back then probably, but all the resources that he used and their addresses and phone numbers. And I would call those and get catalogs from there and had puppet stuff. And it was gold, let me tell you. It was gold to a children's minister. Now it's just resources are rampant, available, and I uh, encourage you to take advantage of all those things. Then when it came to weaknesses, this was almost unanimous also. I'd say between 80 90% um, weaknesses was substituting the resources for hearing God, true ministry, anointing, passion, and impacting children's lives. So what we're finding is even though we have so many resources, we're, we're using those resources instead of getting alone with God, hearing from God ourselves, and really... What God wants to do in our community is we can just reach out on the internet, get something, yay, and we're, we're going. And we re replaced ministry, true ministry, anointing, passion for all these resources. I encourage you to use every resource possible. Don't, don't back down, because, but don't substitute all that for hearing from God yourself. We are, providing, are we providing an opportunity for our children in our churches to know about God? Or are we introducing children to God? See, it's so easy today to teach children about God. All the things we need to know about God. But are we really introducing our children to God? If all we do is teach children morals, core values, and how to make good decisions, and we never give them an opportunity to be born again, we have children that know about God but do not know God. Morals, core values, biblical decision-making come from a changed heart. They don't produce the changed heart. There's curriculums out there today that teach morals and core values, and, and those are good. We want our children to know what we believe, right? But 
that doesn't produce the change in their heart. And when a lot of children get through some of those children's churches, all they are is good moral people. They don't really know God. They don't provide a chance for those children to get born again. We have to provide opportunity for our children to get to know God, experience God. Children can get entertained by the world, play video games, hang out with their friends 166 hours per week at home, at school, all the things our communities offer. Why do we feel like we have to duplicate that at church for the two hours a week that we have them? And I'm not against video, having video games before service starts. I'm not against technology. I mean, I'm the worst offender of technology, okay? But all I'm saying is, if all we do is provide chances for our kids to play video games and, and have fun activities at church, we need to provide chances for children to connect with other church kids. We do need to do that. But on Sunday morning, when it's the two hours that we really have kids, why do we do all the things they can get somewhere else? We need to be impacting the children, making disciples of the children we have while we have them for those two hours a week. We as a church have something different to give them. We have the things that they're lacking all week at home. Let's give them more of God, help them to grow in the word of God, help them to encounter God and become more like God. That's what truly a disciple is, until we grow up, until we look like Christ, until we look like Jesus. Are we helping our kids to grow up to look like Christ, or are we producing fun, moral children? Jesus said to go into all the world and make disciples. Are we making disciples of the children in our churches, or just following the latest children's ministry fads? And I'm not against new resources. Please don't get me wrong. But all, all we do is just jump on the bandwagon that everybody else is running with. And we're not really following what God has for the kids in our children's church. My friend, we're just following the fads that's going on in children's ministry. Tons of fads in children's ministry today. Back when I was starting out, it was just a small group. And we were all one big fa happy family ministering to children. We teamed together. Now it seems like children's ministry has become very competitive. Who has the best children's church? Who has the best traveling ministry? Uh, all this. I'm not into all that. I'm into making disciples. I'm into seeing children born again, growing up until they look like Christ. I want to produce a generation that lasts, not just a generation that had a good time at church and they look back and say, oh, the church was fun then, but it's really not relative for me today. Why are we losing Generation after generation, when they get to be college age, why are they dropping out? Those are the things I, I ask today. Kids need to experience God, know God, not just know about him. There's a thing we had at our church, and we had an, a piece of carpet out in front of the stage, and we called it carpet time. And after service was over, we'd put on worship music, and we'd invite the children to come forward and just get on their knees, get on their faces, and hear from God. Just get in God's presence and just soak in God's presence. And we ask, did you hear anything in your heart? And we encourage children, did you hear something? And, you know, you get one kid every once in a while, yeah, I saw my dog. And he was walking across the road. And that's what I saw. Okay, anybody else? But you know what? We did have children that really heard from God. Man, I, it was like, it was just right in here, you just knew they heard from God. And we need to teach our children to learn to hear God's voice, amen? For themselves, not just because mom said don't do it, not just because dad said don't do it, because God said don't do it. And when they start to do it, their conscience speaks up and says, hey, don't do that. Stay away from that. True worship. Kids need to experience true worship, not just a bunch of motion songs. And I'm not against motion songs, don't get me wrong. But if all we do is motion songs and we're all worried about all this and, and we never really just slow down and lift up our hands, get on our knees, get into the presence of God, we, we will never hear God's voice. All we do is come and, and I'm not against it. We need to start off probably with some motion songs and do some fun stuff, but let it lead into true worship. Amen. Kids need to know God, not just know about him. Number two, 
leading children to Jesus. This seems to be an epidemic today that we do not lead our children to Jesus. We were in one denomination, and, um, and they said, you know what, we don't do altar calls here. We don't give children an opportunity. We, we believe it's the parents' job to lead children to Jesus, and ultimately it is, right? I mean, I led my son to Jesus while we were driving down the road in a car. He said, you got talking about our program, and I said, well, have you asked Jesus into his, your heart? No. Well, would you like to do that? And I prayed with him. Leading children to Jesus. There's much confusion today about what it means to be a Christian. It's very important that we teach our children about their relationship with God accurately. There's a lot of movements today where we teach, be friends with God. Jesus is your best friend. You know, I can be your best friend, but it doesn't change my life for eternity. I can be your best friend, but there's not a transformation that takes place on the inside called being born again. You know, our our friendship with God comes from the change. It doesn't produce the change. Going to church, praying, reading the Bible, being a good person, coming from a Christian family, do not make one a Christian. Jesus said you must be born again. Being born again is a supernatural change that takes place on the inside of us when we make Jesus Lord of our life. That word Lord means he's your boss, he's your master. You love what he loves, you hate what he hates. You know what, we don't talk about Lord anymore. But the Bible says if you believe in your heart, That God raised Jesus from the dead. You confess with your mouth that he is Lord of your life. You know, anymore we just come say the simple prayer and you'll be okay for the rest of your life. And we wonder why people don't really follow Jesus. They just come forward and they say a simple prayer. I want people to know what they're getting into. And it's not about works. It's not about, oh, I got to do this, 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 and this. No, it's grace. But when we come to Jesus, we make him Lord of our life. That means he's our boss. Our master, we love what he loves, we hate what he hates, we're turning our back on our old life, and we're going to follow Jesus now. Repentance. We don't talk about repentance anymore. Repentance is turning away, going the totally other way. In the book of Acts, if you, every time somebody was born again, every time somebody was converted, the word repent was there. But that's not something we talk about much today. When we're born again, when we make Jesus Lord of our life, we're turning our back on our old life, and we're going to follow Jesus. Sometimes that means leaving our friends behind. That means sometimes some of our old habits behind. We're making him Lord of our life. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no taking away of sin. There's no remission of sin. We don't talk about the blood anymore. Now, I'm not saying get all spooky and scared, whatever, out of kids. Talking about blood and gore. Don't show pictures of the passion of the Christ on the screen, but you know what? We, without the shedding of blood, there's no taking away of sin. There's no remission of sin. We've got to include the blood. Making Jesus Lord of our life, repentance. You know what? We have to give children an opportunity in our children's churches to receive Jesus. Like I said, the one denomination said, well, we want our parents to, uh, to do that, so we don't want you doing that. So I, my question to them was, well, what if the parents don't know how to lead their children to Jesus? Well, we have a Billy Graham track, they said. My next question, which I did not ask, which I probably should have, is, well, what if they're not even born again themselves? Do we let children slip through the cracks of our children's churches, saying, well, it's, it's the parents' job, and we never give them an opportunity, and they, they get through our children's churches, learning morals, learning about the Bible, learning all these good things that we need to know, but never having the trans- transformation of being born again. We have to give that opportunity. Now, you know your children, if it's the same kids there every week, you know, I'm not saying you have to do it every week to the same kids and see the same kids come forward week after week. Um, but, you know, when you know somebody's new in the house, give an opportunity for them to receive Jesus. Present the gospel. The, don't just come let Jesus be your best friend. No, we need to share the gospel. There is such thing as sin. God doesn't like it. He sent his son to die on the cross to shed his blood to take away that sin. Number three. Churches need to be more purposeful in what we do. 
We as a church need to be more purposeful in what we do. I said this last night, churches have on average 40 hours a week to teach children what we want them to know. This is after sick days, holidays, shared parenting. And these are the exact stats from my children's church. The kid that was at my children's church the most in one year was there 49 times. Now, that's pretty good. 52 weeks in a year, he was there 49 times. They were there 49 times. It goes down to 43 for the next child. Then it drops to 36. And after that, it was 25 and below weeks out of a year that they were there. And um, so we need to be very purposeful in what we do. What do we want our preschool kids to know when they graduate and go to children's church? What do we want our children's church kids to know when they graduate and go to youth? What do we want our youth to know when they graduate and go to college and eventually graduate and go into the adult service? We need to be purposeful. We need to plan it out. Okay, what do we need? We need to have a plan here. It's so easy just to grab a curriculum and let's fly with this, and we never really know, okay, this kid might have got this part, and this kid might have got that part, but they didn't get the whole what we want them to know. This takes a whole staff setting down together and being purposeful about it. There's a church in Columbia. <clears throat> Let me get a drink real quick. There's a church in Columbia, South Carolina, that has Sunday school, then they have a family service, and then they have an adult service. Now, I'm not saying you have to have a family service every week. Personally, I would like to see children in, to, in with their families at least once a month. That's just me, just to see how their parents worship, see how their parents react with the word so everybody's together. I'm not uh, the um, persuasion that children need to be in the big service every week. I think there is a place for children's ministry. We need it. However, this church, hold on just a second. <clears throat> this church, the pastor and the whole staff would sit down together and they would plan what we're going to do, what we're going to talk about this month. So when they came to Sunday school time, I guess that's what they called it, it was broke down into age groups and they were teaching a certain subject. Then when they got to family service, they taught that subject again. Then when they broke off into adult service in children's church <clears throat> and youth, they were teaching the same concept again. Then they had take-home papers. They'd take home and they would discuss all week what they learned that week at church. When the parents, or when that week was done, I, I'm pretty sure that most of the people that participated in the whole program knew what was talked about that week. They got that inside of them. They got that in their heart. Now, that might not work for every church. I'm just saying what that church does. But we do need to be more purposeful Staffs need to work together. Okay, what do we want our people to know? Where do we want our people to end up at? Where are we going with what we are teaching? What can we do to ensure that our children and youth are connected and part of the entire church so that when they become adults, they stay connected? Now, the group that I'm, I've been mentioning that, that doesn't believe in children and youth ministry anymore, they're saying that, okay, kids that are coming up through our children's church are having this cool experience, youth ministry, and then they graduate and they don't feel connected to the whole church. Well, I, I do see that as a problem. What can we do to keep our kids and our youth connected to the whole church and not just have this cool experience in children's church, have this cool experience in youth ministry, but then when they become adults, it's like, I'm not connected to that church. I have no roots there. All I did was go through children's church and youth ministry, and that was awesome. But when I get to big church, I really don't feel connected. We need to make sure. Now, I don't know what that looks like for every church, but what can we do? I'm asking questions. It will look different probably for every church. <clears throat> These are things we need to think about. Each group builds upon another. Like I said, preschool, children's church, youth, college ministry, adult ministry. Can the church staff work together as a team to accomplish this goal? I believe we can. Amen. And the last thing that I'd like to talk about this morning is partnering with parents. And this is something that's really been on my heart lately. I've been in children's ministry for over 25 years. <clears throat> We've uh, traveled the entire United States ministering to kids and families. And I've came to this conclusion. That you can have the coolest, best children's church in your city. You can teach the unadulterated word of God. Kids can experience God at your church. 
But does this not mean that the children in your children's ministry are being discipled or growing up to look like Jesus, that they're not staying connected? We have an epidemic of children that are, are youth, college-age kids that are leaving the body of Christ, leaving the church when they become college-age. Why? Ask yourself, how many kids that came up in my children's ministry and my youth ministry are still around or even in church today? Start looking at them. Looking them up, finding out where they're at. Unless what kids are getting at home is the same message they're getting at church, but in a more concentrated form, they are probably not being discipled. Children do what children see. Looks like rain again today. Dark clouds gather and fill the sky. Don't know how to talk to you, just know how to say goodbye. see their parents do they do children do what children see what they see their adults or their parents doing is usually the way they follow no matter how spiritual the parents are at church what goes on at home is the most affecting thing fathers are actually the spiritual heads of their household and are to disciple their children kids should be discipled at home And the church comes alongside of the parents to help reinforce what they are getting at home, not the opposite. A lot of times we uh, teach children at church and we take a little thing home and do a small devotion at home and just turn our children loose the rest of the time. It's not enough for a child to have the best children's church in the world for an hour and a half to two hours a week. And get the world the rest of the time. I mean, we have an epidemic in the United States, and I love my gadgets. I'm not preaching against gadgets, but we need to control how much time we spend on our gadgets. Sometimes we just need to shut her down. Everybody say, shut her down. I love my iPhone. You'll see me walking around, do my tweets. If you follow me on Facebook, I do a lot of posting. I call it Jerry's Reality Show on Facebook. But you know what? We... uh, Sometimes we just need to shut her down. We can have earbuds in our ears, something in front of our face, music going 24 hours a day when we get up, when we go to bed, on the way to school, on the way to work, and we never take the time to hear from God. Now, thank God for all the modern technology. I mean, it's awesome. I can let people know that I'm ministering here this morning. They can be praying for me when they're on the other side of the world. It's awesome. But sometimes we just need to shut her down and listen to God's voice. Amen? We have one small snack of God's word each week, yet we have many hot meals of the world. Who do we think we'll become like? We'll become like the world. According to the latest research, parents are still the greatest influence in kids' lives. The home is still the primary place where values are instilled. The way to teach, the way to tell if a church has truly experienced revival is to ask the kids, if anything has changed at home. And I come from a church, I'm not on staff there now, but I was on staff for four years at a church that was a revival church. Now, I never set out to be part of a revival church. It just kind of happened. They had a 28-week revival, and after that, they stewarded revival. 
So it was a revival culture. The way to tell if a church has truly experienced revival, though, is to ask the kids, what are your parents like at home? Do we need another service to go to, or do we need our parents in our lives? Revival is awesome. You see things you want to see and you don't want to see. But you know, on what's going on at home? Is tr- revival, are our families still falling apart? Do we still have addictions in our life? You know, you can fall down under the power of God, but what happens when you get back up and walk? All that's great, but has it really transformed our lives? Do our children see the difference it has made in our lives? Would they say we need another service to go to or another series of meetings, or would they say we need our parents? If you put 100 church kids on this stage, 100 kids, when they graduate high school, only four of them will remain. Did you hear me? You put 100 church kids on the stage, when they graduate high school, only four will remain. That is scary. Look, I just encourage you just to ask the tough questions, go back and and look. And I've asked myself these questions too. I mean, what kind of success rate do we really have? Are we producing disciples? Are our kids staying in church? If not, why not? Go ask Mark Harper, a good friend of mine that wrote the Super Church curriculum. He started going and finding kids that grew up in his children's church setting, that aren't in church today and start sitting down and say, why aren't you in church today? He asked the tough questions. Sometimes we're too afraid to ask those questions, afraid of what the answer might be. We need to ask those tough questions. Amen? Find out. Why, why aren't you in church today? I've asked many of the kids that came up in my children's church, why aren't you in church? A lot of them, they just don't feel like they fit anymore. There's not a place for them. Great ideas and principles do not live from generation to generation just because they are right, nor even because they have been carefully legislated. Ideas and principles continue from generation to generation only when they are built into the hearts of of children as they grow up. That's a quote from George Benson. Principles have to be instilled in our hearts of our children. If we as parents do not know what we believe or if our lives demonstrate inconsistencies in our beliefs, our children will likely struggle in establishing their own values and beliefs. If they don't see it in our lives, If we don't live what we preach at home, our children will say, you know, that's just a cool belief, that's good, but it's not for me. As parents, we must be able to articulate our beliefs and and values and live them out in front of our children. The more a belief or a value is stated, the greater the probability that our kids will remember and apply it. Somehow, we have to empower our parents to be parents, be the parents they need to be. Like I said last night, the, the group of parents that are coming in today, most of them don't have a church background. We assume that they know what we know, but really they don't have a foundation. The worldview is totally different than really what our worldview is. You get talking to them, and it's like, where did that come from? There's a movie on, out called The called divided and like I said I don't totally agree with that you should throw children's and youth ministry out the door but I encourage you to watch this movie you can watch it at dividedthemovie.com it's free there Um, give you a lot to think about it made me chew I chewed on it for weeks I was asking the question do we as children's ministry really have we succeeded in our goals? Have I been just spinning my wheels for all, all these 25 years? Because when I do look back, I, I look back and I say, wow, we have not really been successful in, in growing up children that stay in church, that stay with God. And again, when you watch the movie, don't get all, well, we're throwing children's ministry out the door. Don't do that. Um, but it does have a lot to think about. These are a few things that I just really feel we need to un. Uh, we need to focus on today, leading children to Jesus, not substituting all the resources we have for anointing and hearing from God ourselves. We need to par- partner with our parents. 
and we need to um, be more purposeful in what we do. Let's impact this generation for God. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to minister to children's ministry leaders. Lord, I thank you for your anointing upon each of their lives. Lord, that they'll go back to their communities and cause change. That true revival will take place. Not just at church during meetings, but at home where it counts. That our neighbors will say, Lord, I want what they have. Father, let us hear from you about what our children and our churches need to hear, about what they need. Let us work together as staffs to make the maximum input, impact upon this generation, that we don't continue to lose this generation. Lord, I pray that we do not get to that 4% in America. But Lord, we'll take back this generation. We'll rise up and take it back from the devil. Make a stand. In Jesus' name, amen.